Book Two, Chapter One, Part Five of History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume One, by Henry Charles Lee. Book Two, Chapter One Relations with the Crown. Part Five. Another change which conduced greatly to the independence of the Inquisition was the control which it acquired over its finances. We have seen that, under Ferdinand, the confiscations and pecuniary penances belonged to the crown, and that the salaries and expenses were paid by his orders. The finances of the Inquisition will be discussed hereafter, and meanwhile it suffices to say that, after his death, and the exuberant liberality of Charles to his Flemish favorites during his first residence in Spain, the diminishing receipts from these sources caused them to be virtually assigned to defraying the expenses of the Inquisition, and they were no longer regarded as a source of supply to the royal treasury. Still, the money belonged to the crown, and the Inquisition enjoyed it only under the authority and by virtue of the bounty of the sovereign. The growth of control over income and of virtual financial independence was gradual and irregular. Even Ferdinand, in his watchful care over his receivers of confiscations, felt the need of some central auditor, and it seemed natural that he should be an official of the Suprema. Accordingly, as early as 1509, we find a contador general in that position. In 1517, there are two officers, a contador and a receiver general, and, in 1520, the two are merged into one. When, in 1513, Bishop Mercader was made inquisitor general of Aragon, he desired a statement from all receivers of their receipts and payments, and of the property remaining in their hands, and Ferdinand ordered them to comply, alluding to it as usual on the entrance of a new inquisitor general. This inevitably ripened into the transfer to that official of the control over receivers which Ferdinand had exercised, so that, in place of being royal officials, they became virtually officers of the Inquisition, and eventually were designated as treasurers. By 1544, we find the Suprema to be the final court of revision of all the receivers of the local tribunals, whose accounts were rendered to it and audited by it. Still, in theory, the money belonged to the crown, and its disbursement could only be made under royal authority. The order for the payment of the Ayuda de Costa of the Suprema, July 21st, 1517, was drawn in the name of La Reina y el Rey, Juana and Charles. After Charles reached Spain in September of that year, he made grants from the confiscations with a profusion that threatened to bankrupt the Inquisition. And if we find Adrian and the Suprema also occasionally issuing orders for payments, it was undoubtedly under powers granted by Charles. When Charles left Spain, May 20th, 1520, he gave Adrian a general faculty for this purpose, but it seems to have been called in question, for he found it necessary to send from Brussels, September 12th, a cedula to all receivers confirming it and stating that Adrian's orders, signed by members of the Suprema, would be received as vouchers by the Auditor General. Under this, the Suprema exercised full authority over the funds collected by all the receivers and disposed of them at its pleasure. When Charles returned, he presumably resumed control and, after his marriage with Isabel of Portugal, during his frequent absences, he left the power in her hands until her death, May 1st, 1539. When he saw fit, moreover, he claimed and received a share of the spoils. A letter of Cardinal Manrique, June 17, 1537, 
shows that a portion of the proceeds of a certain auto de fe had been paid to him and another of October 11th of the same year, addressed to him at the Cortes of Monzon, reinforces an appeal not to sacrifice the interests of the Inquisition to the Aragonese demands, with the welcome news that the receiver of Suenca had arrived with the 10,000 ducats for which he had asked from the confiscations of that tribunal. Charles's hasty departure in November 1539 to quell the insurrection of Ghent left matters in some confusion. The Suprema, on March 20, 1540, wrote to Chancellor Granville that cedulas for the salaries under the crown of Aragon were always signed by the emperor and that the inquisitor general could not do it. They had sent him a power for execution similar to that given to Cardinal Adrian, but he refused to sign it, saying that they could do so under Cardinal Manrique, forgetting that there had been the empress who always signed the cedulas, wherefore they asked him to get the emperor to sign the power. He doubtless did so, for an order, June 12th, on the receiver of Valencia to send 1,500 ducats for the salaries of the Suprema purports to be by virtue of a special power granted by their majesties. On Charles's return, he again assumed control, and when he went to Italy in 1543, he left Philip as regent, while during the absence of Philip there were successive regents who signed cedulas as called for by the Suprema. Yet, in spite of these formalities, the control of the crown was becoming scarcely more than nominal. It is true that, in 1537, Cardinal Manrique declared that he could not increase salaries without the royal assent, but, when the crown undertook any exercise of power, the little respect paid to its commands is seen in the fate of an application made in 1544 by Juan Tomás de Prado, notary of the tribunal of saragossa to prince philip for an ayuda de costa of three hundred ducats philip ordered his prayer to be granted but the death of inquisitor general tavera served as a convenient pretext for disregarding the command it was repeated for the same amount january eleventh fifteen forty eight and finally on june fourth inquisitor general valdez authorized the payment of a hundred ducats. To perfect the absolute control of the confiscations, thus gradually assumed, it was necessary to keep the crown in ignorance of their amount. Its right to them was incontestable, and the Inquisition deliberately abused the confidence reposed in it when their collection was left in its hands. The less the king was allowed to know, the less likely he was to claim his share, and the policy was adopted of deceiving him. As early as 1560, we have evidence of this in a letter to the inquisitors of Sicily, instructing them, when reporting autos de fe to the king, to suppress all statements as to the confiscations, but to report them to the Suprema, so that it may determine how far to inform him. This was doubtless a general mandate to all the tribunals. It was repeated in instructions of 1561, and we shall see that it became a settled practice. This systematic concealment was the more indefensible from the fact that the Inquisition was now obtaining funds from other sources than confiscations. We shall see hereafter how it utilized the scare caused by the discovery of Protestantism in Valladolid and Seville in 1558, with the plea of additional expenses thus caused, to obtain from Paul IV a levy of a hundred thousand gold ducats on the revenues of the clergy and the more permanent endowment of the canonry to be suppressed for its benefit in every cathedral and collegiate church. A large portion of the inquisitors, moreover, already held canonries and other benefices for which, under a brief of Innocent the Eighth, February the eleventh, fourteen eighty five, 
they were dispensed for non-residents. The burden of the holy office was thus thrown largely on the ecclesiastical establishment, which remonstrated and resisted, but was compelled to submit. It could thus look with equanimity on the shrinkage of the confiscations. In Valencia, an agreement was reached in 1571, by which the Moriscos compounded for them with an annual payment to the tribunal of 2,500 ducats. The Judaizing heretics had been largely eliminated, especially the more wealthy ones, and it was not until some years after the conquest of Portugal, in 1580, that the influx of Portuguese new Christians brought a new and profitable harvest. All this tended to the financial independence of the Inquisition, although the crown by no means abandoned its claims on the confiscations. A book of receipts, given by the royal representative in Valencia for the proceeds of the confiscations in 1593, shows that, under the financial pressure of the time, Philip II was reasserting his rights. The treasury was empty when Philip III succeeded the throne in 1598, and, among his expedients to raise money, he ordered the receivers of the tribunals to send to him all the funds in their hands, promising speedy repayment. The Suprema had no faith in the royal word, and instructed the tribunals to retain enough to meet their own wants. The obedience of the tribunals was by no means prompt, and the Suprema was obliged to order Valencia to comply with the royal demand and to furnish an oath that no money was left. In the earlier years of Philip IV, the tendency of the Inquisition to emancipate itself from royal control grew rapidly. We shall see hereafter that when, in 1629, the king called for a statement of salaries and perquisites, the Suprema equivocated and suppressed nearly all the information required. Still more significant was its attitude respecting the colonial tribunals, which the king supported under an annual expenditure of 30,000 pesos, with the understanding that this should cease when the confiscations should become sufficient. These, which had been small at first, rapidly increased in the 17th century and were enormous between 1630 and 1650, when the whole trading communities of Peru and Mexico were shattered, enabling the tribunals to make permanent investments that rendered them wealthy, besides sending heavy remittances to the Suprema, which moreover seized the goods and credits of Seville of the colonial Judaizers. In addition to this, in 1627, a prebend in each cathedral was suppressed for the benefit of the tribunals. Yet the salaries were still demanded of the royal treasury, and the repeated efforts of Philip III and Philip IV from 1610 to 1650 to obtain statements of the receipts from confiscations and pusinary penances were completely baffled. That was an inviolable secret which no royal official was allowed to penetrate. It is true that the colonial tribunals, on their side, adopted the same policy in concealing, as far as they could, from the Suprema the extent of their own gains. Yet, in the ever-increasing distress of the crown, demands were made upon the Inquisition, as on all other departments of government demands which it was forced to meet. Thus, for the ten years, 1632 to 1641 inclusive, an annual sum of 2,700,360 marveides was required of it to aid in defraying the cost of garrisons and fleet, and a statement of October the 11th, 1642, shows that it had paid the aggregate of 11,583,110 in Veillon and 18,700 in silver, leaving a balance still due of 8,474,790. Evidently, there was good reason for concealing its revenues. In 
in the frightful confusion of the finances which followed the revolution of Portugal and the revolt of Catalonia in 1640, while Spain was heroically battling for existence against France and its rebellious subjects, the demands were varied and incessant, sometimes for sums so small as to reveal the absolute penury of the state, and Philip's impatient urgency as he chafed under the dilatoriness of the responses shows the desperate emergencies in which he was involved. In 1643, a royal decree of February the 16th ordered all officials to send their silver plate to the mint, a watch being kept and a report made so as to see that each sent a quantity proportioned to his station. To a complaint of delay in performance, the Suprema replied that those who had sent in their silver could get no satisfaction from the mint. The delays were such that the promptitude required by the king was impossible. Even more arbitrary was the seizure, in 1644 at Seville, of a remittance of 8,676 ducats in silver, a remittance from the colonial tribunals to the Suprema. In protesting against this, the Suprema, February 29th, gave a deplorable account of its condition, owing to the demands made upon it by the king. On the 10th, he had called upon it for 16,000 ducats, which it would be wholly unable to raise if deprived of the silver that had been seized. It was already short in 7,724,843 marviides of its annual expenses, and the provincial tribunals were short 5,318,000, for it had impoverished them to meet the royal demands. Last year it had sold a censo of 18,000 ducats belonging to the tribunal of Saragossa, which was beseeching its return. It had also given the king 10,000 ducats for the cavalry, and to raise this amount it had taken the sequestrations of the tribunal of Seville, a sacred deposit, including 20,000 ducats worth of wool, the owners of which, having been acquitted, were besieging it for their money. This doloros plaint was effective in so far that the seizure at Seville was credited on account of the demand for 16,000 ducats. How much of it was true we can only guess, for the Inquisition had means of raising money outside of its judicial functions. When, in 1640, the king summoned its familiars and officials to render military service like the nobles, the Suprema arranged that they should buy themselves off, and from this source was chiefly raised 40,000 ducats, expended on two companies of horse, in return for which, by a cedula of September 2, 1641, the king promised to maintain inviolate the privileges and exemptions of the familiars and officials. These instances, out of many, will suffice to show how the crown, in its days of distress, was recouping itself for abandoning the spoils of the heretics. In time, these special and arbitrary demands were systematized into an annual requirement of fifty horses, estimated at an outlay of about 5,500 ducats, and the raising and equipping of 200 foot, costing 8,000 ducats. The Suprema was in no wise prompt in meeting these demands. A cedula of June 24, 1662, tells it that what is due for the present year, as well as the previous years, must be paid at once. Otherwise, an inventory of its property must be given to the President of the Treasury, who will raise the money on it. Subsequently, there was a feeble attempt to return some of these contributions, and, in each of the years 1673 and 1674, a trifling payment was made of 10,000 reales, but, in 1676, the Suprema stated to Carlos II, that in all it had furnished for remounts of horses, 90,000 ducats vellon and 10,000 in silver 
and that its total assistance to the crown had amounted to no less than 800,000 pesos, equivalent to over 500,000 ducats, to accomplish which the salaries in many tribunals had been unpaid and vacancies of necessary offices had remained unfilled. Still, as we shall have occasion to see, the Suprema always had money, not only for an undiminished payroll, but for perquisites and amusements. The crown could not accept this assistance, however grudgingly rendered, without a sacrifice of its supremacy, and the Inquisition came to treat with it as with an independent body. About this time, the Suprema happens to mention, in a letter to the Tribunal of Lima, that it had lent the king 40,000 pesos, of which 10,000 came from Peru and 30,000 from Mexico, and that the Count of Medellin had become security for the return of the loan, as though it were a banker dealing with a merchant. Yet all parties knew that these colonial remittances were derived from confiscations, the ownership of which the crown had never relinquished. This is the more noteworthy because, about this time, the king suddenly asserted his claims on some large sums which could not be wholly concealed. In 1678, the tribunal of Majorca unexpectedly made a successful raid on the whole new Christian population of Palma, and, in the early months of 1679, there were more than 200 penitents reconciled. As they constituted the active trading element of the place the confiscations were enormous, and the affair attracted too much attention to be hidden. As soon as the news came of the arrests, the king wrote, May twentieth, 1678, to the viceroy to look carefully to the sequestrations, because, in case of confiscation, the proceeds belonged to the treasury. The Suprema, however, made him hold his hands off with direful threats and kept control of the liquidation. After the condemnations, a consulta of July 5th, 1679, shows that 50,000 pesos had already been paid to the king, but that the Inquisition was resolved to have its full share. In November, the king acceded to a compromise under which 200,000 pesos were to be used to endow certain tribunals and to cancel certain loans made to him by the Inquisition, probably those just alluded to. The balance coming to him was estimated at 250,000 pesos, but, in the handling of the assets and the settlements with creditors, the property melted away till the Suprema reported that it barely sufficed to meet the portion assigned to the Inquisition, and finally, in 1683, the king had to content himself with 18,000 pesos spent on the fortifications of Majorca and the payment of him of 2,000, which the Suprema assured him that it advanced at considerable risk to itself. The secretiveness so carefully observed undoubtedly had its advantages or it would not have been so persistently claimed as a right. In a consulta of 1696, the Count of Frigiliana states that, when he was viceroy of Valencia, he had in vain endeavored to get from the tribunal a statement of its affairs, and he asked the king whether or not the Inquisition possessed the privilege of rendering no account of its assets and income. At length, the quarrel between Inquisitor General Mendoza and his colleagues in the case of Froilian Diaz and his banishment to his see in 1703 gave opportunity for royal intervention and investigation. The War of Succession had deranged the finances of the Inquisition and it had appealed to the king for help. He required a statement of the payrolls investments, and revenues of all the tribunals, which was furnished March 9, 1703, after which, on May 27, 
he issued a decree declaring that he must put an end to the abuses and disorders which had crept into the administration and disbursement of its property, in order to relieve the embarrassment of which it complained. He therefore annulled all commissions and appointments without obligation of service granted by the Inquisitor General, whether within or outside Spain. The papers of all jubilations, new places and gratuities created or granted since the time of Valladares, in 1695, were to be placed in his hands. In no case thereafter should the Inquisitor General jubilate any official of the Suprema or local tribunal without consulting him, and any such act issued without a previous royal order was declared void. No ayuda de costa or grant exceeding thirty ducats veon for a single term was to be made without awaiting his decision, and this decree was to be placed in the hands of all receivers or treasurers for their guidance. It was so transmitted June 8th, with strict orders for its observance. This was a resolute assertion of the royal control over the finances of the Inquisition, and it held good, in theory at least, however much it may have been eluded in practice. About the middle of the 18th century, a systematic writer describes it as still in force, and states that no salaries can be increased without the royal approval. It so continued to the end, and, under the restoration, an order from the king, countersigned by the Suprema, was requisite for any extraordinary disbursement. Philip had reasserted but made good the right of the crown to the confiscations, by claiming a percentage of the rentals of all confiscated property. But he listened to appeals from the tribunals, and, in 1710, we hear of Saragossa and Valencia being practically restored to their enjoyment, a liberality which was doubtless followed with regard to the others. In 1725, Valencia expressed its fear that the alliance with Austria against England, France, and Prussia would result in its having to restore the confiscations, and the blow seems to have fallen, for, in 1727, the Suprema, in the consulta of December the ninth, describing the poverty of Saragossa, attributes it to the king having taken away the confiscations which he had granted. With the gradual amelioration of the Spanish finances, the source of revenue must have been restored, for, in 1768, the Inquisition is described as enjoying the confiscations which the pious liberality of the monarchs had bestowed. There were other sources of revenue, rehabilitations or dispensations from the San Benito and disabilities, commutations of punishment, and the pecuniary penances known as penas y penitencias. All these will be considered hereafter but a few words may be said as to the latter in their relation with the royal authority. The penitents, who were reconciled under edicts of grace, were not subject to confiscation, but were punished with fines under the guise of pecuniary penance, at the discretion of the inquisitor. We have seen how numerous these were, and we can conjecture how large were the sums thus exacted, for penances of a half or a third of the penitent's property were not uncommon. Similar fines were usually accompanied sentences that did not embrace confiscation and formed a continual, although fluctuating, source of revenue. Sometimes there were special officials for their collection, but, when this was entrusted to the receivers of confiscations, they were instructed to keep a separate account of them as the two funds were held to be essentially different and, as a rule, were to be employed for different purposes. In the earliest instructions of 1484, these pecuniary penances are said to be imposed as a limosna, or alms, to aid the sovereigns in the pious work of warring with the Moors. But, in the instructions issued a few months later by Torquemada, 
This is modified by ordering them to be placed in the hands of a trustworthy person and reports to be made to him or to the king in order that they may be spent on the war or in other pious uses or in paying the salaries of the Inquisition. Both the destination and the control of these funds were thus left undetermined and they so continued for some years. In 1486, we find Ferdinand giving orders for sums from this source for various uses, for the war with Granada, to pay the salaries of the lay judge, to pay expenses of a tribunal of the Inquisition, to repay Luis de San Angel for advances made to tribunals. In one case, his tone is apologetic, and he asks Torquemada to confirm the order. In others, his command is absolute. This indicates the uncertainty which existed both as to the use and the control of the pecuniary penances. So long as lasted the war with Granada, whatever was taken by the crown might be regarded as devoted, directly or indirectly, to that holy object. But when the conquest was achieved, in January 1492, that excuse no longer existed, and doubtless the inquisitors looked with jealousy upon the diversion to secular objects of the proceeds of their pious labors. The confiscations unquestionably belonged to the crown, but the penances were spiritual funds which for centuries had always inured to the church. There must have been a sustained effort to withhold them from the royal acquisitiveness, to which Ferdinand was not disposed to yield, for he procured from Alexander the Sixth, February 18, 1495, a brief directing the inquisitors to hold all such monies subject to the control of the sovereigns, to be disposed of at their pleasure. Even this was resisted, and Ferdinand and Isabella complained to the Pope that they were unable to compel an accounting of the sums received or to collect the amounts, to correct which Alexander issued another brief, March 26, 1495, commissioning Jimenez, then Archbishop of Toledo, to enforce accounting and payment by excommunication and other censures. This was equally ineffective. There was a privacy and simplicity in the imposition and collection of a penance very different from the procedure of sequestration and confiscation, and Ferdinand, at least for a time, abandoned the struggle. This is manifested in a clause in the Instructions of 1498, enjoining on inquisitors not to impose penances more heavily than justice requires in order to ensure the payment of their salaries. But the principle was formally recognized by Ferdinand and Isabella in a cedula of January 12, 1499, reciting that, although they held a papal brief placing at their disposal all monies arising from penances, commutations, and rehabilitations, yet they grant to the inquisitors general all collections from these sources, both in Castile and Aragon, to be used in paying salaries, disbursements being made only on their order. Ferdinand, however, was not disposed to relax, on any point, his control over the Inquisition, and, on April the 10th of the same year, we find him forbidding the levying of penances on the members of a town council for foutership of heresy, doubtless a speculative infliction for some assumed neglect in arresting suspects. In 1501, his renunciation is already forgotten, and he is making grants from the penances as absolutely as ever, even empowering Inquisitor General Desa to use those of Valencia to the extent of a hundred ducats a year for the salary of Jaime de Mochildos, the Roman agent of the Inquisition. So, in 1511, we find him granting to Enguera, Inquisitor General of Aragon, a thousand libras out of the penances to defray the expenses of his bulls for the see of Lerida, and authorizing him to pay from them an ayuda de costa of two hundred ducats to Juan de Gualbes, a member of the Aragonese Suprema. 
Then, in 1514, he places all the penances unreservedly at the disposal of Inquisitor General Mercader, to be employed on the salaries and other necessary expenses of the Inquisition of Aragon. This seems to have been final. After his death, instructions sent to the Tribunal of Sicily assume that the Inquisitor General has sole and absolute control. It was the same in Castile. Instructions issued by Jiménez in 1516 direct the Receiver General, who was an officer of the Suprema, to collect the penances from the receivers of the tribunals, who were to keep them in a separate account, and not to disperse them without an order from the Inquisitor General. After this, we find the Suprema in full control. There is virtually no trace of any interference subsequently by the Crown, and the Inquisition found itself in possession of an independent and by no means inconsiderable source of revenue, which it could levy almost at will from those who fell into its hands. The only exception to this that I have met is that Philip the Fourth, in his financial distress, by a decree of September the thirtieth, sixteen thirty nine, claimed and collected twenty five per cent of fines, and he scrupulously limited these to those inflicted in cases not connected with the faith, that is, in the exercise of the royal jurisdiction, civil and criminal, enjoyed by the Inquisition in matters concerning familiars and other officials. End of Book 2, Chapter 1, Part 5